Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what your time zone is. My name is Adina Friedman, and I'm the CEO of Young Judea Global. And I'm going to just take one moment to remind everyone that we're going to be recording this. Great. Welcome, and thank you so much for being part of the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest. Together, we're making climate action a central moral issue of the Jewish community on the occasion of Tu Bishvat. This event, Sustainable Nation, Israel as a Leader in Renewable Energy, is brought to you by Young Judea. In this program, Young Judea alumni will explore the creativity, entrepreneurial spirit, and values-based work of the renewable energy revolution happening in Israel. We will hear from some of the leaders in this movement about why they got involved and what has been accomplished to date and what is yet to be done and how you can get involved. The idea of renewable energy, according to the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, is hardwired into Judaism through the example of Shabbat, the greatest source of renewable energy, the day that gives us the strength to keep on creating. For six days we work and on the seventh day, a day of rest. For without rest for the body, peace of mind, silence for the soul, and a renewal of our bonds of identity and love, the creative process eventually withers and dies. It suffers entropy, the principle that all systems lose energy over time. According to many, a shift to renewable energy is paramount to securing our environmental future. Today, we will hear from some of the leading experts, some technical announcements, this program is being recorded, as I said, and the recording will be shared in a follow-up email with everyone who registered. Please stay muted and use the chat to share your questions with the panelists. Following the panel conversation, we'll look to the chat and the questions that many of you sent in advance. We'll also be integrating the answers throughout the program. So on to our program. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator, Seth Marin. Seth, in addition to being a proud alumnus of Young Judea, is a fintech entrepreneur, global business leader, and philanthropist. Seth is actively engaged in philanthropic work globally, including in Israel and South Africa. Seth, I'm now turning the program to you. Um, thank you, Adina, and welcome, everybody. Um, it is uh, a great pleasure to be hosting this panel. Um, and uh, so let me tell you, um, it could be somewhat argued, uh, although not argued well, that um, Jews around the world have been at the forefront of cl the climate change movement and sustainability movements. But what you cannot argue is that young Judean Jews have been at the forefront of the green movement, sustainability, and climate change movements in Israel. So, you know, our panel um, are, are the, the, the people who have actually done the work um, and started these movements uh, in Israel. And it is unbelievably exciting to, to have them here and to, to share their thoughts with you. Um, so just a, a run of show, just so you know, and we have a very short period of time. We've, we've gotten a tremendous number of questions from you already. We're trying to um, integrate them into the conversation that we're having. And, and like you know, Young Judea and the Sikha, we wanna make it very interactive um, and very informal. So we don't, you know, not just talking heads here. Um, but the first thing I want to do is I want to have um, everybody, all the panelists, introduce themselves. And then we're going to go through the, the start of the, the green movement uh, in Israel and some of the sustainability movements. Um, and the, the start of the solar power industry in Israel, which is fascinating, um, and um, how that has actually grown uh, globally. And then talking about what is our responsibility as Jews in um, the, the sustainability and the climate change movements. So with that, I would like to start um, by asking all of the panelists to uh, introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about you know, the path um, and how you got to where you are today. What have you done? Um, and um, how has Young Judea influenced you in that journey? So um, if we can start with um, Alone, um, then we'll go to David Rosenblatt, then we'll go to David uh, Lehrer, and then Noah, and then Merola. So if we, can, if we can get started alone, take it away, please. Thanks so much, Seth, and thanks everybody for coming. Chag Sameach, happy Tu Bishvat. There was a book that came out several years ago that was called Everything I Needed to Know in Life I Learned in Kindergarten. And I would rewrite that book as anything I needed to learn in life I learned in Young Judea. And I'm going to start at age 13, and David Lair is on the panel, so I can say that he 
was a senior in high school with his own van and he threw me in it one night. I was a 13 year old kid. He said, there's a war in Israel. The Yom Kippur war is raging. We need to raise money for gas masks. And he sent me knocking on doors. I was a new kid in town in Raleigh asking for money. So I was already learning how to fundraise at age 13. And then a couple of years later, I came back from TY and they told us there was a Soviet Jewry crisis. And so we went to the state house in Raleigh our Young Judea Club and had a demonstration. So I already learned how to do that in Young Judea. And the list goes on and on. I think the main thing I could say in terms of becoming an environmental activist in Young Judea was two things. First of all, being a madrich meant that I was always having to, uh, I wouldn't say make things up, but deal with subjects I didn't know a whole lot about and sound informative and scramble and take the information and try to be impactful. And that's something which I find as environmentalists every day, there's new problems that I never studied, including climate change, which I never really learned much about. And, and Young Judea gave me that ability. And the second thing was, was we got the, uh, the mission as we came there. They, we drank the Kool-Aid and we went forward and they said, Israel is a country that is imperfect and you have to make, they called it then Chalutzik Aliyah. Then years later, they came into more of a Tikkun Olam notion. But the idea was Israel's not an ossified place. You can make a difference. And I've been very fortunate to have discovered that to be true. In fact, just about everything that taught me in Judea it was uh, validated when I came here. So that, that's my uh, personal story. And I've been delighted to be an environmental activist and academic in Israel. So Alon, you started the Arava Institute. What were you thinking? And you also started the Green Movement in Israel. What the hell were you thinking? Well, I um, when I finished my graduate work, I came back to Israel and did not want to go into academia. And I had been very impressed with the American uh, public interest environmental law group. So I started a public interest law organization in Tel Aviv, which still operates this day, Adam Tevvedin. And I think it does a lot of very important work, but I was living on a kibbutz at the time. And the kibbutz decided after six or seven years that I was having too much fun flying up to Tel Aviv and soothing all these polluters. And they said, you have to come back and do something. And I had other ideas I wanted to set up a, a ranch of horses in Timna, and they said, you don't know anything about being a cowboy, come up with something realistic. So we, we had this notion, it was just a time and the peace process was coming, but bringing but what, people what together. what kibbutz that alone? That was Kibbutz Keturah, I'm sorry, I should have oh, said was that. It? Yeah. You'll have much more authentic representatives coming soon. But basically it was, uh, you know, we were trying to uh, find me a job on the kibbutz and that's how it started. If you well, no, it was it was a notion that Israel was undergoing a transition and finally being integrated into our neighborhood. And that the, maybe that the, the kibbutz, uh, kibbutz Ketura could be part of this uh, new Middle East. And it's taken a long time to get there, but I'm actually more hopeful than ever that the uh, Israel as a country and the Arava Institute as an environmental institution can seize that kind of role. As far as the green movement, you're talking about a political party. Well, we just sort of felt like our voices wasn't heard enough. And we started a political uh, party, which has actually gotten uh, twice members into uh, Knesset, not enough, but I believe once we do resolve the Arab-Israel conflict, then there will be room, just like in Europe, for a very, very powerful and influential Green Party in Knesset. So David Lair was actually my madrich as well um, at TY. Um, and so we go back a ways. Um, <laughs> David actually uh, made Aliyah while I was on your course. So I remember that day very, very vividly. David, talk a little bit about yourself and what you're doing and what you've done. Uh, thanks, Seth, and thank all of you for joining us, and thank uh, Young Judea for uh, for bringing us all here together. Uh, uh, happy Tuvishvat. Thank you alone uh, for giving me a job uh, or creating a, something that uh, that now I, I work in for the past 20 years. So I, I'm uh, also, uh, along with Alone, I'm from, I'm from North Carolina. I grew up in North Carolina, uh, was active uh, in Young Judea. Uh, um, was a, was the uh, muskir of the of the club, and I was the muskir of Galil Yam region. So uh, went through it all. Um, <laughs> excuse me. But growing up, a growing up in Young Judea, I mean, so much of what alone said. I think I say all the time, which is just about everything I ever learned uh, um, that's of any value in terms of managing uh, things or organizing things. Uh, I, I picked up when I was fifteen, you know, years old. Uh, um, running around uh, organizing uh, uh, the Tzofim and organizing the, the convention and organizing everything. 
Um, and, but so that part of it, of course, I got from Young Judea, as well as the strong uh, 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 belief in what we called back then social action, which today I think is really tikkun olam. Uh, it, it was it, it became part of our DNA that wherever you are, and I, I don't think this is just about people who made Aliyah, I think this is about every young Judean who finds themselves anywhere in the world, um, believes that it's part of our, part of our, our you know, mission on this planet uh, to make a difference and to make the world a better place. Um, and so that was part of it. And the other part of it, I wanna give credit where credit is due is to North Carolina. I think it's no uh, coincidence that both Alone and I uh, um, uh, came to Israel and looked for how we can have an impact on the environment because we grew up in a community uh, there in the research triangle where the uh, um, where the EPA was was first established, uh, um, which was very uh, environmentally conscious. Um, I had this. Uh, I came to the kibbutz, and in truth, when I got to Keturah, um, uh back in 1978, it was a young kibbutz. It was a struggling kibbutz. Um, uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, it was really all about survival uh, and, and, and enabling the kibbutz to, to continue to grow and flourish. Um, so a lot of the things that I, I wanted to work on uh, when I came to Israel kind of got put on the side uh, so that I, because I had to pick the onions and, and sort, the, uh, sort the melons and didn't have time for all that other stuff. Um, but as the kibbutz grew and to my great, uh, um, uh, really uh, just pure luck um, alone uh, established the RFI Institute. And in, in 2001, uh, I replaced alone as the executive director of the RFI Institute. I've been here ever since. Uh, and it's really been an honor and a privilege to help lead uh, this organization to develop uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, infrastructure to be able to advance cross-border environmental cooperation in the face of political conflict, bringing Jews and Arabs together, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, around issues that are of common concern to everybody, such as climate change, uh, environment, renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, uh, and water. So um, that's where I'm at today, and I uh, want to thank uh, alone for for really uh, uh, being the one to lead our kibbutz to sustainable uh, development. David Rosenblatt, um, you were involved in truly the first solar field, um, putting solar in, in Israel. Um, and you know your company has um, worked with uh, others around the world to help install solar there. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to. Oh, thank you. I, I, I feel privileged to be on the panel with you, uh, everybody. Uh, for those who are new to the names here, the, these are real legends that we're talking about. Um, we, uh, we're we just a company that tried to add to the Young Judea uh, legacy. Um, basically, what, what I did when I was growing up with Young Judea was I was involved because of my sister who's on the call and my brother. And um, I remember Young Judea always learning and hearing stories, um, whether they were about pioneers in Israel, whether it was about pioneers from the Bible, it was about stories and how they overcame. And I remember going uh, to Israel uh, after college um, on, a, on a Young Judea program. And there was this um, new Ole uh, person who moved to Israel and he was very old. So normally you meet these Olim and they're really young, right? And they're ready to go. And we were kind of all kind of confused as to why we're speaking to a, a really old guy with, with really gray hair and he could barely like move, like literally could barely move. And he said a line that influenced me the rest of my life. Um, Cause I'm hearing a story, right? So it's like young today has stories, I'm hearing it. And he says to him, he says, and I know what you're all thinking. And we're like, okay. He says, yeah, why are you talking to an old guy? And he said the, the line of, of, of that, that, that stuck with me, he said, there might be snow on top, meaning his hair, but there's fire in the chimney. And I realized you cannot judge a book by its cover. And my whole approach to Israel at that moment and many other things changed, but the coin dropped for me with respect to how young Judea and sort of not judging a book by its cover, because if you look at Kibbutz Keturah, if you look at what young Judeans have accomplished and the changes they made and the theme of tikkun olam 
It means do not judge what you see, judge what's inside, right? And uh, it is with that mo with that character and uh, and and neshama, the soul, that we formed our power because what we saw was a country that was about to pollute itself to death. You were, they were building 800 megawatt um, energy uh, projects for coal-fired power plants in Israel. There were protests going on. And one of the things that you knew about Israel was it's a technology-based society, economy. You cannot do that if you're gonna just pollute the hell out of your country because people won't wanna live there. And unlike other countries, it's an energy island. Nobody shares its energy. So the Arabs uh, countries, they share a grid. They have a trans grid that goes across lines. Um, so whatever Israel needs for energy, it needs. And if it doesn't produce it, it doesn't have its economy. So it's a national security issue. And when we got together, um, Ed Hofflin from Kibbutz Keturah and Yosef Abramowitz and myself to found Arava Power, our whole belief was it's not what we see, it's what can be. And we adopted David Ben-Gurion's thought that the desert shall bloom, but in a whole new way and be a light unto the nations through solar. Um, and I can go into some other key details, but I'll just give you a couple metrics of what happened. In 2007, we formed the company. We went through 24 government agencies at the national, regional, and local levels to change the law on tax, land use, and energy use. We were the first company ever to sign a power purchase agreement as a private producer of power to feed the grid in Israel um, since 1948. That was a historic time. Um, the CEO of our company at the time had the best quote. He said, it's very challenging to be a pioneer in a pioneering country in a pioneering industry with a pioneering government. And that was the whole thing. We thought that our competitive advantage not, was not being smarter or brighter or having a better vision. It was our ability to knock our head against the wall and firmly believe that the wall would ultimately give up. Uh, and that's what we did. And today what you have in Israel is amazing. You have the entire Southern part of Israel, a lot included, that is completely lit by renewable energy. Um, and you're actually, as we were talking beforehand, David Lear was saying, we actually produce too much energy. But to give you a sense of the vision, when we started Arava Power, the largest solar field in the world was one megawatt. Okay, what we did envision as our first field was five megawatts, 500% bigger than anything else. We thought we were thinking big. Today, India and other countries are building multiple gigawatt, meaning 1,000 times larger than what we did back then. So the whole field has advanced. But more importantly for Israel, it now has become from the most expensive form of energy, which was the knock against it. Our first field, we got paid um, one shekel, six, uh, 60 agarot per kilowatt hour produced. And today people are getting paid 18 agarot per kilowatt hour produced. So you have a business that has improved the efficiency for the government of 941% before it includes all the lack of pollution from not having to build the other things and uh, all the other benefits that come from it. So that's that's sort of what our of our power started in today. Um, it's a rip roaring industry with a great future. And it's because we got to stand on the, sh on the shoulders of others like Alone and David who had come before us. So one would think that Israel would be very welcoming for um, you know some renewable energy source, considering that, you know, um, Moses took a wrong turn and left us with absolutely nothing. Um, but it wasn't the case. And we'll get into a little bit um, uh, more of that later. Um, Noah, um, who comes from a uh, young Judean dynasty, I must say, um, uh, you know, Israel was very early on in putting um, solar on people's roofs to just heat the water. And then I think the whole solar um, industry in Israel went dormant for quite some time. Now NOAA is leading a uh, fast growing company that's actually installing solar panels um, throughout Israel. NOAA, take it away. Uh, yeah, thank you, Seth. And thank you to everyone, Tu B'Shvat um, uh, Yeah, look, I mean, uh, as David Rosenblatt just said, Israel, um, it, it, the amazing things Arba Power did are actually quite recent in the history of solar power. Israel was not the first country to jump into uh, into this sort of new technology. Obviously, 
anyone who went to Israel on any Young Judea program or on a family vacation or any other uh, reason saw the, the Dud Shemesh, the, the solar water heaters on just about every rooftop, making for perhaps not the most aesthetic uh, cityscape, but certainly a recognizable one. Um, and uh, Israelis just assume we, and, and it is an efficient technology to help save a lot of energy from, from uh, water heating. Um, but then we just sort of stopped doing it. And actually the Israeli government uh, and the environmental ministry or the, the, what is now the Ministry of Environmental Affairs and before that all the predecessors and the energy ministry and, and, and uh, maybe alone can speak to that more how the politics behind it works. Um, were not particularly helpful uh, in the first, in, in the past 30 years really to, to making solar energy uh, really take off in Israel. But in the past five years or so, um, there's been a huge boom in the industry. Um, the uh, current uh, energy minister, Yuval Steinitz, you can say what you will about his politics, and I'm sure there are people who are for him and those who are against him. Within the ministry, he's actually affected quite a lot of change, uh, positive change, and the market here has opened up. In the last um, six years, we've jumped from less than 2% uh, solar energy in the country to now over 9% uh, at the end of 2020, uh, which makes us one of the leading countries in the world. Um, uh, as someone recently told me, second behind uh, Honduras in terms of uh, total generation, um, in terms of, uh, sorry, in terms of generation as a percentage of overall consumption. Um, and so first of all, um, I, I made Aliyah seven years ago after going to Camp Young Judea Midwest and Camp Tehuda and uh, immediately actually after making Aliyah work for Young Judea, I see a couple of my former bosses on this call. So thanks guys. Um, as well as a number of former um, counselors and everything. And I, I think it's, it's obvious that for me, the decision to make Aliyah and to get involved in this field and basically every decision I've made in, in my professional life and just in terms of being here in Israel for it, all springs from, from Young Judea. Just uh, if you boil it down to one thing, uh, the, the values from, from camp for, and, and, and just where it lead, led, led me to. Um, and I think that, you know, I may look a little younger than the rest of the people on this panel. Uh, and, and the Zionism for my cohort, my generation, I think uh, we're the, the, the ones that we grew up not calling it necessarily Chalutznik uh, Aliyah, uh, but rather directly talking about social justice and, and uh, tikkun olam uh, as the purpose of being here, of, of doing what we all did. And, and I mean, coming on Mahon in Israel, we actually did hear from, I think, both David and alone, and soon after making Aliyah, I took a trip down to the Arava Institute, or to, to the uh, Kibbutz Turah to talk to some of the people from Arava Power. Um, so, you know, for me, doing what, what I'm doing today is directly related to all of my experiences in Young Judea. And I will say that at my, uh, I have a small company called Kedma Solar, and we are installing on houses and on businesses and on um, army bases and all sorts of buildings throughout Israel, benefiting from the great work that literally people sitting on this panel have done to move the country forward in terms of uh, its, its policies. And, and when, you know, when, when my friends and I decided we wanted to start this company, we were basically, uh, the, my two friends were working in, uh, in construction at the time. And we were sitting on a porch on a very hot summer day in, in Tel Aviv, drinking a couple of beers and said, we're sitting outside, you know, sweating our asses off and uh, not getting much out of it maybe we should use the sun a little bit. And then we basically the first place we went to was talking to young Judeans about what they'd done in environmental stuff in Israel and if solar was really a field to get into. So, so I do have to say that it's no coincidence that, that, that I'm in the field that I'm in. It, it really comes from my experiences in young Judea. Thanks, Noah. Merala um, was actually on your course with me. That's when we first met um, some time ago. And Merala, like, most of the rest of us are um, not sitting in, in Israel, but um, sitting here in the United States, um, being um, and, and taking um, responsibility um, for getting involved, right? So, you know, one of the things that we're going to talk about is some of the trials and tribulations and successes that, um, you know, people on this panel have had. It's not easy by any stretch, right? But it took people um, and their perseverance to actually get it done, right? And Mirala is uh, somebody who's actually taking a leading role in trying to get people to, you know, take on that responsibility um, and get involved. So, Mirala. Thank you so much, Seth. It's an honor to be on this panel uh, with my Madrich, 
David was also a madrich of mine. And uh, Seth, you know that I started out in Young Judea in Brookline with your wife, Anne, Zichron Ali Bracha. We were in the same club. And um, I remember my very first uh, Young Judea retreat. I can picture it now. <laughs> and at that retreat, we learned a song. Ani ve'ata nishane et olam. You and I will change the world. And that was, I guess that sums it up, as many of you have said. It started me on a path to wanting to be involved and feeling like I could make a difference. I actually started out my career uh, working in the Jewish community in Hillel and Federation and then as a, as a consultant. But in 1997, I was on a trip to Yosemite National Park. Um, and I saw something there that changed my life. It was a solar composting toilet. I won't go into what a solar composting toilet and how it works right now, but it got me interested um, in something that I really didn't know I was interested in before, which was environmental problems. And it sent me on a journey and I eventually earned a PhD in environmental psychology. And my interest in it is in how do we actually get people to change their behavior to do the right thing and be environmentally responsible. Uh, but what, what did Young Judea give me? Uh, Young Judea really gave me one of the most important things was these deep relationships with people in Israel. So as I became involved in environmental issues here in the US, I always wanted to stay connected with those people. Some of them are here, some of my heroes, um, and try to do what I could to support their work. And over the years, I've been involved with the Heschel Center for Sustainability, uh, with Teva Ivri, um, and I'm an investor in Gigawatt Global, the uh, successor of Aravat Power. So anyway, here I am in the United States. And um, what can we do here that can help Israel? Well, everything we do in the United States makes a difference for Israel. Our greenhouse gas emissions here are second in the world. We produce 15% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, although we only have 4% of the world's population. And as I'm sure we'll talk about more later, the Mideast is so vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So we as Jews need to use our influence, you know, for the United States, for the world, but also for Israel. About a year and a half ago, I moved to Washington DC and I started to think about what could Jews in Washington do um, to mobilize Jews to be in, more involved in uh, changing the United States policies on climate change. Um, and with some friends, um, using those Young Judea organizing skills, I founded Jewish Earth Alliance. And our mission is to help Jewish communities around the US to build relationships with their members of Congress so that we can use our influence to change United States policy on uh, climate change. And just to give you an idea of what we do this month, our action alert is about uh, legislation to move the United States to 100% electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles, uh, because transportation is the largest contributor to the United States greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're interested in seeing what, you're what we're doing, you can take a look at jewishearthalliance.org. I hope you'll all be Googling it while we continue our conversation. Okay, thank you all. Um, and now I just wanna make sure that um, all the panelists feel free to um, chat, talk, and ask each other um, questions. But you know, I want to I want to get things started um, with uh, alone. I'll go back to alone, um, and you know, just um, if you can like uh, talk to us about the trials and tribulations, one of opening up an institute where you think about bringing in people from warring nations together to talk about sustainability, and then you know the the green movement. What was the reception when you know you and some of the other young Judeans out there? went and decided to form a political party around being green. You know, you make it sound so uh, unlikely, but at the time it seemed like the most natural thing in the world. Maybe that was, maybe if you're talking about the young Judean, they sort of make us delusional. You know, they, they told you at age 14 here, take these 12 year olds and talk to them about Zionism and keep them excited and, you know, uh, these were things that were didn't seem so likely. But the truth of the matter is, I always felt that uh, when you're an environmentalist in Israel, you're actually starting with some very good advantages as opposed to maybe trying to start things in another country like the U.S. For example, I really believe that there is a core fundamental 
uh, environmental impulse amongst Israelis who are really raised with a culture of hiking and strong taxonomic uh, literacy in terms of what the trees and plants are. I mean, when I was growing up in North Carolina, I think I could have identified 10 to 12 plants and flowers, but my daughters who grew up in Israel, they're constantly teaching me the names of flowers and butterflies and birds and stuff like that. So there's a real connection to the land and that was sort of part of the Zionist package. And, um, and so I think that works together. And the other thing I'm very grateful for, and this is something more recent, but it's one of the great tragedies, I think, of the United States political map is that all of a sudden the environment became a partisan issue and that the right is maybe considered to be unenthusiastic environmentally or maybe sometimes disingenuous in terms of the way they um, you know, discredit environmental reality. And the, the Democrats and the left are considered to be more uh, progressive. And Israel, that doesn't exist at all. And in fact, if you're trying to map the, the best uh, environmentalists over time, I would think the right actually have a, an advantage. And, um, and so I'm on the board of the Jewish National Fund. I just recently was elected Nash, uh, uh, deputy chairman. And my strongest allies, one of them is an ultra-Orthodox. He's the deputy, he's the director of the city of B'nai Brak. And the other one is, is, is a right winger from a settler. And, and that really makes uh, it easier when you don't feel that you have to, uh, the environment is above the uh, politics here. And I think that makes it much easier to do crazy things like creating an institute or a political party. And there was a lot of criticism when we made the Green Party because they said every party should have a green component. Why are you trying to make it a special interest? And um, there might be something at that point as well. Can I jump in here on the JNF? Please. <laughs> Thanks very much. So Alone uh, is now the deputy chair, correct? Am I correct? Of the JNF. And uh, I don't know if everybody here knows that the Jewish National Fund owns 13% of the land in Israel. And it has a very big role in building infrastructure, including roads, 200 reservoirs, and also has some investments, I believe, in sustainable energy research and that kind of thing. And we want Alon Tal to be the chair of the Jewish National Fund. In 2015, I ran with the uh, Green Israel Party for the World Zionist Congress. There's a lot to say about the World Zionist Congress, but this is an area where diaspora Jews can have a direct influence on what happens with the environment in Israel. And I just want to put all of you on notice. I, maybe you uh, noticed this year um, there was a big scandal um, because uh, the uh, World Zionist Congress, uh, several of the parties got together and wanted to cut out the reform and conservative movements. And those parties, the, the World Zionist Congress appoints the board of the Jewish National Fund. Um, in 2015, when I ran, we did not succeed in getting enough votes on the World Zionist Congress to get Alon Tal appointed chairman of the Jewish National Fund. But in the next election, we intend to get enough votes for that. And that is completely controlled by diaspora Jews. So Alon, I hope you can say a little bit more about it because you, you understand it a lot better than I do, but I want to put everyone here on notice that you can use your, your votes, your political influence to make really good things happen in Israel and to make Alon Tal the chair of the JNF. Thank you, Carola, for our first action item coming from this panel. Okay, and we, we must succeed. We must succeed at that. Um, David Rosenblatt, um, you know, I, I would love to hear just the, you know, you talked a little bit about the, the trials and tribulations of, you know, getting Israel to actually back the first solar power, um, solar field. Um, and I'd really love to, you know, hear briefly, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. And, and then tell us about from that point, you know, where you've gone and, and talk a little bit about also at, at the end, talk a little bit about what uh, Energia Global has, has done globally as well. Sure, uh, so we, <laughs> I, we have family in Israel on both sides, my wife's side and my side. And, and uh, fortunately they're, they're very um, independent and successful, um, particularly on my wife's side. Uh, he, she has a, a wonderful uh, cousin who's very, very uh, prominent and um, so I was at his house when we, were, when we first decided to start this company. And I remember it was a fall of 2007 and I was speaking with somebody at the party or the, that afternoon uh, and his name was Yossi Bahar, which if people are familiar with Israel, you know the Bahar plan. So he was the writer of it in 2003, 2004 that helped get out of the economic doldrums that the country had found itself. 
So I took the opportunity to say, listen, I think that Israel needs to change its energy policy. It's a dead end for a variety of reasons. And, and what advice do you have me? And he and I are friends. Don't get, he just passed away. So God bless his soul. I was, I worked with him on another board. So I, I miss him every day. Um, but, but he turned to me because he was very honest. We had a good relationship. He said, David, the one role about entrepreneurship in Israel is do whatever you can to not work with the government. And that was it. And I thought he was joking and he'd have a follow up because he had been in the government. He would understand how to work. He had no follow up. He's like, no, don't do this. And it was like a moment of truth, like, oh, my God, here's a guy who actually cares about me, has seen it from the inside, and he's telling me, don't do it. So you have to ask yourself at a certain point, like, you're about to spend a number of years of your professional life on something. Do you really want to do that in a dead end when somebody who you respect and has been successful in that field working in the government told you not to? And, 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 and your worldview comes into play. I mean, really, your worldview, like, am I a talker? Am I a doer? What, what are we? Like, you have moments. And I left that. I said, you know what? I have to do this more than ever because, because of what I learned at Young Judea, because of the people I was surrounded, the way I was raised. It was like more of the challenge. It's, and, and, and that's what we did. And just to give you a couple of other sort of fun insights, when we were getting started, nobody would give us money because they looked at us like we were absolutely nuts. We were working out of a converted chicken coop on the on Kibbutz Keturah that are now offices. And um, and uh, and nobody would give us money. There still works in those chicken coops, David. I know. I love that. That is my favorite office of all time. So, turkey so, coops. Turkey coops. Turkey coops. Turkey. I'm sorry. I always think of the... Anyways, my brother tells a story where it's chicken, so it's, it's funny because he worked in the turkey coop. Uh, so, so, uh, so we needed to figure out how to be Israeli about it, like really do the presumptive, like we had to make sure we were bigger than we were. So we decided that we would, we, we called a Chinese company. We said, we're going to build a, a gigawatt of solar power, ship us a couple of solar panels and we will test them in the hot sun and give you the data. So they ship these things in and we're waiting six weeks for these things to come in. We get a call from the Mossad. We, we have to talk to you guys. We have to meet us at the port, whatever. We're like, what did we do? Oh, my God. It just turns out the, the solar panels arrived. No one had ever seen a solar panel that size. To Noah's point, the only thing they've seen were the little ones to put on the roof to do the bucket of water. They hadn't seen an industrial-sized solar panel. They didn't know what it was. And it had wires sticking out and electricity and things written in Chinese. It was scary. So it took us about three weeks to convince them that this was all legitimate and it was actually a solar panel. And what we ended up doing, and David Lear from the uh, Arab Institute knows, we put these things out front of the converted turkey coop and we called it our alpha field. And we took videos and pictures. And at the end of the day, the data was all nonsense. It didn't really work. The panels were awful. But it ended up spurring, you know, pictures of a thousand words. It was like being Israeli about it because we just were a chutzpah dick enough to convince people, including a little company in Germany called Siemens, that we were real. So Siemens ends up putting $15 million into us, which really birthed the whole thing in a major, more, in a more major and professional way, all because we were gutsy enough to talk a Chinese company into sending us a panel that didn't work and we were good with a with a with a camera, and that's really like the, the 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 stuff that you you go through when you're starting out and you're being a pioneer. Where that morphed into is we would today operate more than 100 megawatts of solar uh, fields across about 25 projects in Israel. Um, we're doing some other things, but most importantly, what we're proudest of is some of the other things that came out of it. And I'll just I'll mention a few of them very briefly because I want others to talk. First is that um, we wanted to give back. We wanted to have the young Judea Neshama. So in, in the Bible, they teach that you don't, you don't take the, uh, the, 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 the clippings off the field if you drop them, and you don't take the field, the corners of the field. And then that way, those who are poor and need food at night can run in and get, get what you left. And, you don't, and it's the greatest form of charity because you don't know who you gave to. So each of the corners of our fields those panels produce energy and produce revenue. 
We take all of that every year and then we give it uh, to charity. So we give some to uh, like the Elie Wiesel um, Foundation. We give some to, to your point alone, we give it to um, a, a therapeutic horse farm and the Arava. So you can, you can know that you're part of being a cowboy tangentially. Um, and we give it to a number of other players. Um, and to show you how difficult it is to do the right thing sometimes, when we did that after our first year, um, it, we had a big multi, like $50 million loan on this field. And uh, the bank sends us a default notice because what they said was you took money, even though we paid our loan, we paid the, the, the maintenance on the loan, but we went outside the covenants of the agreement and we gave money from the field elsewhere. And we literally had a fight and we have a letter. It's not like, this is not an exaggerated story. We had a letter where they basically said you're in default of the loan because this is their first solar loan. They're paranoid that they did the wrong thing and they're gonna blow up our loan because we gave charity. And it was amazing because we would have thought that would have been one phone call and it would have been done and ended up being two months and three law firms and it was done. And today we still give money. So that's one thing we're very proud of. Second thing, we have spurred other companies and other industries within the renewable industry. So as an example, um, we, we formed Gigawatt Global and Energia Global, which are sort of the same thing. We, we use them interchangeably. And what we thought of is if we can change the world in Israel, we can change the world in other third world countries where they don't have enough energy. They can't keep up economically with the rest of the developed world because they don't have the electricity. And because solar is a distributed source and you don't need a whole grid in your country, you can drop it and increase people's life. And if you just think about it for a second, if you have one little piece of electricity that can power a refrigerator and a light bulb, you can all of a sudden have nutrition and education in any country you go to. It's massively changing. It's like blows your mind. So we built in Rwanda, as Seth, you know very well, um, at, at, at the Children's Village. Um, and there's another uh, field that's coming up, but there's different fields now in 13 different develop, developing countries in Africa that are being built. And Meryl is, is investing and, and knows about it well. Uh, and those, that's just a, that, that's, that we're, that's something we're very proud of. But we also birthed um, the robotic cleaning. So, the, so we, we're saving water when people think we're saving energy. When you do these fields, particularly in the desert, like behind me, you get covered with sand all the time. The amount of water and energy they have to drive trucks through to, to carry heavy water to wash them is a huge energy, energy waste. And like when you actually do the math, you feel almost guilty about building the solar field. And particularly like countries like India and other places where they don't have water, it's a real use because now you can't build energy because you can't clean the field. If you can't clean the field, it won't produce energy and you're stuck forever in a little thing where you can't develop. And that's true in Africa as well. So we actually ended up being the seed investment um, for robotic cleaning that robots every night without water clean. And we also are the uh, seed investment uh, or the number of the executives uh, that, that graduated from us when in, in now doing solar cars. So there's a lot of good things that come out of these, um, this, this uh, path. Thank you, David. Um, we, have, we have about 10 minutes before we have to start wrapping up. So um, I, I just wanna put in the fact that, um, you know, we partnered, my wife partnered with, um, you know, David and, and gang to build the first solar field in East Africa, which um, provided most of the electricity for Rwanda. So thank you for that. Um, David, I'd like to turn it over to you and talk about, you know, the incredible work that you guys are doing, not only in terms of bringing nations together, you know, warring nations or, you know, in some form of non-peace, um, and really exploring and educating on sustainability and, and uh, climate change issues as well. How is okay, that? So that was good. I, I just want to say, I want to say two things that I'll answer your question, Seth. First of all, um, uh, I must uh, uh, mention also that when the Arava Power Company was established, it was established in the Turkey Coop, which is the Arava Institute, it was established in our offices. And as a thank you for that, and as a thank you for providing that uh, initial alpha field uh, space, um, the Arava Institute received 1% of equity in Arava Power, which 
actually provides us with a very nice little bonus at the end of every year, we're, we're thrilled. Second of all, I wanna say is that the funny story that David told about how things got started, if you uh, go back uh, 10 years before to 1996, when, when Alone and Miriam Sharton started the ROVI Institute, they had a very similar story. They wanted to run a program. They wanted to bring students from all over the world. They needed to recruit the students with a brochure. They didn't have students to recruit with a brochure, so they got a bunch of volunteers and members to sit on the grass and look like they were students, took pictures of them, and said, come to our program. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the traditions continue. Today, the Aravai Institute uh, um, is one of the one of the important uh, research institutes here in the Aravai, together with the, uh, with a lot a lot renewable energy and the uh, the Science Center, uh, exploring the use of uh, solar and renewable energy, um, together with other technologies. Um, uh, David mentioned the idea of uh, of distributed or decentralized uh, technologies. Um, and actually, that's where we focus most of our effort, um, because uh, especially in terms of our neighbors, in terms of uh, um, uh, Gaza and uh, uh, West Bank, uh, um, the, the, the situation there is pretty tough. M much of those communities are what we call off-grid communities. They're communities which are not connected to centralized, uh, not just electricity, but water, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, and um, we think, and we at the Arva Institute really believe that um, uh, decentralized technologies um, are actually uh, where, where the world is going. Uh, decentralized technologies are, are small scale technologies that um, you don't need to pump all of your wastewater, for example, to a centralized sewage system, a centralized uh, uh, um, uh, wastewater treatment plant, uh, you know, 50, 20, 50, 100 kilometers away and then pump it back uh, after it's been treated so it can be used in agriculture. But you can do it in place. And in many cases, uh, we combine uh, solar together with uh, um, wastewater treatment together with uh, desalination so that communities can become more resilient uh, in, in a period of uh, climate change. Um, the second area that we're very involved in, in terms of uh, renewable energy and cross-border work is the whole idea that Israel itself does not have a lot of, uh, a lot more space uh, um, for building large solar fields. Uh, um, land is, 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 uh, is very uh, valuable here. It's very, it's a scarce resource. Um, and therefore, um, the future of large solar fields is perhaps in question, uh, which is why if I had some money, if I wasn't a kibbutznik and I had some money, I would be investing in Noah Berman's uh, uh, business because that is the future of solar in Israel, rooftop. But uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, our neighbors, um, our neighbor to the east, Jordan, has lots of land, uh, lots of land and the same amount of sun that we have. Um, and the opportunity here for cross-border uh, work is, is uh, to uh, have an energy water exchange. Our, uh, Israel is a leader in desalination, which requires a lot of energy, uh, but could conceivably supply water for our Palestinian and uh, Jordanian neighbors, while Jordan has lots of land and could be supplying electricity for, uh, 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 for Palestine and for Israel. And in order for that to happen, we obviously have a lot of work to do, not just on the technical side, but on the, uh, on the human side. Uh, in order for that to happen, uh, we need to have trust. Um, I, often, I often say that, you know, a lot of people think that water is the scarcest resource in the Middle East, but it's not, it's trust. Uh, so that's what we try and do at the Arab Institute. We're trying to, to uh, empower a new generation of Palestinians, Israelis, and Jordanians here at the Arab Institute, here on Kibbutz Keturah, uh, to build trust uh, across the region and to turn us into a more peaceful and sustainable Middle East. So from what I understand, Israel is the first rain independent um, country in the world where, you know, we don't have to, um, you know, rely on rainfall to um, have drinking water. Is that right? So do you, do you see water, clean water as a means to peace in the region? I think that water is water is both a scarce resource and a shared resource, um, and I definitely think that it's possible to uh, utilize water, which is really, by the way, water is really energy. 
you understand, if, you, if you're drinking water, it's because it was pumped from somewhere, it was desalinated somewhere, water is energy. Uh, um, and so, uh, and, you know, I do think that water and all of our shared environmental resources has the possibility to be the, the, the framework for, uh, for uh, building trust. And that's what we uh, are promoting here. The Arvai Institute is the idea that the environment uh, is a mutual concern for everybody. Someone was saying in the very beginning, I think, uh, or uh, about the politics and how politics, is, how the environment is above politics. Um, that can be true, Alona is saying that, that can be true, I think, even on a uh, cross-border regional level. People may uh, disagree about politics, about religion, about, about you know, borders and refugees and everything else, but about the environment, everybody agrees. So very quickly, Noah, what do you see for the state of solar in Israel going forward? What are, what are the objectives and, and what can, what's possible? Sure. So um, a few months ago, the environmental or the environmental and energy ministries uh, collaborated and, and released a, a set of plans. Honestly, this is something that alone may be able to explain a little better than I can. But I, uh, one of the main elements there was that uh, in 2015, Israel committed to 17% renewable energy by 2030. Um, and they just upped that goal to uh, 30%. Um, and it's a very reasonable goal, to be honest. I think that the way that, uh, I, I saw that there was a little a chat on the side about wind power. Unfortunately, as David said, there's for a number of reasons, not that much potential for wind power in Israel currently, um, but uh, there is a lot of potential for solar. The focus right now is on rooftop projects. That's what we uh, focus on at Kedma. Um, and there have been a number of reports that have varying statistics, but uh, ultimately, we think that if we cover the majority of rooftops in Israel, and, and when I say the majority, we mean it could be uh, just an example of some of the projects we've worked on and some other companies work on, army bases, schools, apartment buildings, private homes, um, basically uh, basketball courts, anything like that, um, that we can reach somewhere between 50 and 90% of uh, renewable energy, but that's really up for debate and has a lot to do with how uh, consumption changes in the future as well. I think there's a few places that we need to focus. Um, first of all, again, solar energy is one of the, Israel's greatest resources. We're just a very sunny country with only uh, 60 or 70 uh, cloudy or rainy days per year. Um, but it's also going to uh, rely on energy storage. One of the problems we're facing uh, right now, I saw someone ask about this before, is what if we were to put enormous fields in the Arava or in the Negev? Um, that would be wonderful, except that uh, then you have to transport the energy a long way and you can lose a lot of power along the way, um, as well as the idea that it would have to take up a lot of uh, land there. So what the government is a little slow on in implementing, but is starting to turn towards now is how we can also use batteries uh, so that we can uh, have a more secure energy supply just from solar power. And right now, the uh, secondary source that we use with solar is gas. Uh, the nice thing, I, gas obviously is not renewable. It's not the ideal solution environmentally. The nice thing about gas when you talk about using it as a secondary fuel is that it's much easier to fluctuate the amount you're using. So as opposed to coal, uh, Israel was 60 or 70 or 80% coal generation. Uh, if you look back 20 or 30 years, um, you know, the, 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 the nice thing about gas is it's a little less uh, dirty than coal, or actually significantly less dirty than coal. It's still much dirtier than solar, but you can at least fluctuate the amount that you're putting into the system based on the amount of consumption and generation you have from other sources. No, Not I'm perfect, but it's at least the, a, I'm getting the red flag around. here. So I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Um, any last words? But, but. I just wanted to say one, one thing about, to, to emphasize Noah's point, Israel did make this leap from 17 to 30% commitment for solar. But the astonishing thing is that the Minister of Environment, her name is Gila Gamaliel, just said, that's not enough, we need 40%. And now there's a raging battle between the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Environment. And the amazing thing is they're both Likud politicians. Could you imagine Mitch McConnell and say Lindsey Graham fighting over who can make more uh, renewable energy? And that's the situation we have in Israel. So I just wanted to say that, that it's a source of encouragement that on these issues, I think we're all in this together. Thank you. Let me just wrap up and just say, you know, um, I hope some of the takeaways that, that people have, have um, gotten from this panel is that, you know, one person can really make a difference. Um, and everyone on this panel has made an unbelievable difference to Israel, to, to the world itself, 
in terms of climate change and, and solar energy and, and sustainability. Um, and, and what we have been taught in Young Judea is to do exactly that. So, you know, um, from a Young Judea perspective, the world is clearly a better place because Young Judea is in it. Um, and part of our responsibility is to make sure that we continue Young Judea and, and Young Judea continues to grow the people that you know are changing the world. And you know, if you do want to get involved in this, please reach out to Mirala or any of these you know, people on the panel because you know, get involved, right? It's up to us to, to be the change that we need to be. With that, thank you, panelists. You, you guys are awesome, really. I love you all. Adina. Thank you so much, Seth. As we conclude our program, I want to thank our moderator, Seth Marin, and our panelists, Noah Berman, Marilla Goldsmith, David Lehrer, David Rosenblatt, and Alon Tal for sharing their wisdom and experience with us today and for leaving us with a clear charge to act. I also want to acknowledge Mike Berman, president of Young Judea Global, who is joining us today and is the proud father of Noah Berman. I invite you to go to the jewishclimatefest.org backslash action, as you can see on the slide here, and consider some important ways you can take action right now so we can make a difference as a community on climate. On behalf of Young Judea and the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest, thank you for joining us today. Together, we can make a difference on climate and create a healthy, sustainable future for our community. If you enjoyed the session today, please check out the festival website for over 160 events now through Sunday and share your enthusiasm for the festival with friends and family. To hear more young Judeans making a difference in the environment, go to Sunday's 3 p.m. session with Yossi Abramowitz um, on the program called A Light Unto the Nations, an International Solar Revolution. Thank you so much once again.